Hello everybody, my name is Joelle Simone Anthony. I'm also known as the Grave Woman. If this is your first time visiting, I'm going to go ahead and ask that you hit the subscribe button, which is somewhere around here. So today I am going to be talking about my least favorite part of the embalming process and also giving a little overview of what the embalming process is. Now before I get started I want to say for any funeral directors, medical professionals, or anyone else that has any knowledge of the embalming process, you know that we can learn what the book has to say and we can do a thousand embalming cases, but every case is extremely different. There is no one way to embalm every single body because everyone has different things going on within their bodies, on their bodies. Each way that a person passes away is extremely unique and significant to that particular case. So I am doing a very, very, very non-comprehensive and basic overview. If I happen to skip over a step that you're aware of, kindly let me know in the um, comment section. It's a very basic overview for what would be considered the standard process for the average case. Now, according to Robert G. Myers, the book Embalming, History, Theory, and Practice, the fourth edition, which is what I used when I was in school back in 2011, the embalming process begins when the deceased is transferred from the transferred from the removal cot to the prep table. So anything done before that, according to the book, is not a part of the embalming process. The embalming process begins when that body comes in contact with the embalming table. So in order to kind of give this overview of what the embalming process is, I wrote down some things from memory. And like I said, if I skip over something or go into too much detail about something, Kindly let me know in the comment section, but again, this is a very, very non-comprehensive and basic overview of the embalming process from my memory. Now, the first thing that I would do um, when working during embalming a body would be to remove all clothing and belongings. And of course, once you do that, you know, um, I'd make sure that everything that does not pose a biohazard to the family is packaged, inventoried, and securely stored until it can be given back to the family. And things that do pose a biohazard, meaning that maybe they have bodily fluids on them, either vomit or urine or feces or blood, you know, you want, I would always make sure that I would dispose of those because you don't want to give those back to the family. It, it would be kind of gross. The next thing that I would do is to primarily disinfect with a topical or surface di disinfectant. And more than likely, this would be a spray. So I would spray the body to disinfect. Of course, before I even go any further, I would have on all personal protective gear, mask, covers, aprons, gloves, anything that's going to protect me and make sure that I'm not coming into anything that could potentially cause harm to myself or anyone else in the funeral home. So let's just go on ahead and put that out there right now. Um, once I had disinfected, done a primary disinfection of the body, the next thing that I would do would be to wash the body with some lukewarm water and a germicidal soap. Um, this is the time where I also shampoo and clean out the nails and the hair and remove any anything that isn't a part of the person's essence and by that I mean glass, maggots, lice, debris, um, just anything that is not a part of that person's natural anatomy I would remove at this time and this would also be the time where I would clean under the fingernails and you know just do little things like that when you're preparing someone in the funeral home or I don't know why I'm talking in like third or second person but when I'm in, when I'm preparing someone in the funeral home I treat that person as if I'm almost bathing or getting a baby ready for the day and by that I mean just taking the time to shampoo the hair clean under the nails just really give them an entire bath because that's how I would want to be treated or that's how I want to be treated when I pass away so that would be the third step that I would do 
And the fourth step that I would do would be to shave, remove hair, um, trim the beard and everything. And I also have a funny, it's not really funny, or it wasn't funny when it happened, but it's funny now. I have a story about um, removing hair. You have to be very careful when removing hair from the deceased because you, because I think something may look good, the family may be used to seeing this person with that long hair hanging from their, their chin or, you know, the hair in their nostrils. That just may be how the person walked around in everyday life. So it's extremely important to just get the family's permission before doing anything that can't be reversed. And I learned that lesson the hard way and actually was very aggressively told off by a family member when they found out that I had removed a chin hair from their grandmother. That was their grandmother's identifying, you know, feature. She was known to have this extremely long chin hair and unbeknownst to me, I'm just thinking, okay, I'll pluck it out. And it was not what the family wanted and they were very vocal about that. And I felt so horrible at the time, but it's amazing how something so simple can have such a grand effect on someone's overall memory picture of their loved one. So if there are any aspiring or funeral directors, aspiring or current funeral directors working out there now that did not know that, I hope that that's something that can help you along your career. Um, the next thing that I would do after, you know, shaving and doing things like that would be to set the features. Now, for those of you who aren't in the funeral service industry, what I mean by setting the features is that I would close the eyes and you know close the mouth and position the hands the arms the head and the rest of the body in the way as close as I could get it to how I would want it to look in the casket and there's a lot that goes into that and a lot of um, it takes a lot of practice to be able to do those things efficiently but that would be the next step so once I've done that, I would apply the massage cream, which is a cream that's used to prevent dehydration during the embalming process and just from exposure to air. Um, and sometime in between all of this, I would have put together the embalming solution that I'm going to be using to treat the body according to what the body has communicated to me that it needs um, through my evaluation and you know, going through the process for identifying what solution would be necessary. The person may have jaundice, they may have extreme rigor mortis, they may have, you know, discolorations or just certain chemicals would be used to treat certain things that are going on within the body. And I would create my solution to aid in addressing those issues. The next thing that I would do would be the actual arterial embalming, which is draining of the blood from the vascular system and replacing that blood through the injection of the embalming fluid and solution that I just spoke about. Now, this is where we get into my least favorite part of the embalming process. Once the, the arterial embalming is completed you do something in most standard cases that aren't fully autopsied and you know just most standard cases called cavity embalming now cavity embalming is defined as withdrawal of gases fluid and semi-solid flu semi-solids from the body's cavity and hollow viscera by means of suction with an aspirator and trocar and when this definition refers to cavities and hollow viscera, it's speaking of your stomach, your lungs, your intestines, your kidneys, your liver, and just all of your internal organs that are going to be found in your thoracic region, in your pelvis, in your abdomen, just things, the, the parts of your body that help you function every day. This is what's going to treat those areas. So, the way that this is done um, is through taking a really, really, really long trocar for an adult and a smaller trocar for a child or a baby. And I'll post a picture of that here.
and basically what happens is you take the tip of the trocar which is extremely sharp and you insert it into the abdomen and pelvic area and basically use it to pierce each of those major organs and aspirate or in layman's terms suck out all of the contents of those organs and the reason that this is my least of my least favorite part of the embalming process is because even though I know that the individuals that I am doing this to are deceased in my mind I'm hurting them and I know that's not real but it's just it's it's a very strange feeling it's almost like I, I feel like I'm almost stabbing them and it's not anything that I've gotten used to but it is something that I've learned how to deal with and it has to be done and it has to be done for several reasons to retard the decomposition process to prevent gases from forming and microbes and germs and bacteria from multiplying within the cavity of the of the body and to prevent blood uh, discolorations and staining on the surface of the body which is the skin and even though I know all those things and I understand the reasoning behind them and I know that they're a vital product you know this is a vital pro um, part of the embalming process it just I don't know it feels weird to me especially when puncturing organs such as the heart and the liver because I understand logically that those are lifelines without those organs you can't survive and even though they're deceased I still feel as if I'm causing them some type of harm which is completely irrational but it's just why that is my least favorite part of the embalming process and once that's done you know you use the same trocar to insert what's called a cavity fluid which is basically a liquid formaldehyde formula that is going to internally preserve the body um, and from there you know you wrap up your embalming process through closing the incisions packing the orifices um, washing and drying the body again and applying necessary plastic garments and wrapping up your documentation. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you'd like more videos like this talking about the actual breakdown of the embalming process in a more detailed way, let me know. I don't mind doing more videos. My name is Joelle Simone Anthony. I'm also known as the Grave Woman. You can learn more about me by visiting my website, www.thegravewoman.com. You can also follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Google Plus, at The Grave Woman. If you Google me, I'll pop up everywhere. As always, live life, love hard, and I'll talk to you next time.